Okay, so the point of today's lecture is to review logic, um, both in the propositional and the first order case. And then we'll finish up by touching on some ideas uh, with soft or annotated logics as well. And the reason why we're doing this one in class is, uh, you know, as opposed to deep learning that I'm, you know, pretty confident most of you have some kind of background in that already. If you don't, we have some materials posted uh, that you can look over. They're under the lesson three uh, page. But logic, want to make sure everyone's on the same sheet of music on the basics. So with propositional logic, we assume the existence of a universe of ground atomic propositions. So these, this universe, this set of these A's, each A is essentially something that can be true or false. Now, one thing I want to say about everything I talk about here is understand that this is kind of a way of describing logic. Other, there could be frameworks that describe different variants of this. So for example, I'm saying that all these A's are associated with either being true or false. Or maybe they could be associated with a real value, or maybe they could be associated with an element of a lattice structure, or maybe I have a tri-value logic where it's true, false, or uncertain. There's bunch of other possibilities. What I'm talking about here is kind of the very basics because all of you I'm sure have had some like, you know, digital circuit course as an undergrad where you did truth tables and stuff like that. This is gonna sort of take those ideas that you learned back then and formalize them in a, a more rigorous way. So we have, this is kind of the basic thing. We have this universe of uh, atomic propositions and then we have a syntax. Now, the syntax specifies the language, and you may hear the word logical connector. And I wrote this as a grammar. So a formula is your basic syntactical structure, and that can be an atom. It could be a negation of a formula. It could be two formulas connected together with a conjunction, or two formulas connected together with a disjunction. Notice I'm not saying anything about what these mean. I'm just saying how you can assemble formulas in the language. There's no underlying meaning here. Okay, and that's really important because with logic, it's key to separate syntax from semantics. And you might, if you really get into reading logic papers, you might see papers that say, we take such and such logic with alternative semantics. Uh, and so like a couple of years ago, um, uh, Jerry and I did a bunch of work on something called APT logic. And we found that there was an alternative semantics that made more sense for uh, learning as opposed to reasoning. And so we wrote a bunch of papers based on that semantics. Um, so that's why there's this little bit of a divide and the papers might seem a little weird when you're reading it because they're just saying, hey, the, this is what the symbols are that, and how they combine together. It's not saying anything more. One other note is um, common. You might hear the term literal. And a literal refers to any atom or the negation of the atom. All right, so semantics. Semantics is the other half. Semantics, it specifies the underlying meaning. So what we're talking about with this propositional logic is uh, what is known as classical logic. So that is where everything is kind of true and false. And with classical logic, the main semantic structure is called a world. And this is very easy uh, to understand what a world is because any subset of your universe is a world. And here with this simple world universe of three atoms, I went ahead and I wrote out a power set, which is equivalent to the set of all worlds. So very simple and straightforward, but again, there are other kinds of semantic structure possible. If it's a probabilistic logic, it could be something like a Markov decision process. It could also be a probability distribution over worlds. Um, if it's a fuzzy logic, it could be a mapping from atoms to numbers or atoms to um, elements of a lattice structure again. 
in this simple case, worlds, all subsets of the universe. The intuition with the world is that for a given world, the atoms in that world are considered to be true. The atoms that are not in that world are going to be false. By the way, uh, don't forget, if you have questions as I go along, ask them as I'm briefing, okay? All right, so you have the syntax, which is how stuff connects together. You have the semantics of the meaning. The satisfaction relationship is how the two relate to each other. And so here, very simple, we say if the formula is a single atom, a world satisfies, the symbol here is for satisfaction, the formula if that atom is in the world. So in the case, going back to what that grammar looked like a couple slides ago, if you're in the case where the formula is a single atom, satisfaction is just to find that atom is in the world or not. Okay, this is also an inductive definition, just like our grammar. So formula F equals not formula F prime, then the world satisfies F if the world does not satisfy F prime. And then conjunction, now you uh, decompose your formula into the two formulas that are conjuncted together. And it's simply W satisfies F if the W satisfies F prime and F W prime. And with this junction, it's the same thing, it's just put two and four. So again, this is really easy for the classical case. The point isn't that this is something, you know, uh, really important in and of itself, but the way that we're describing it is, I think, what I really want to communicate to you. Because then as we build up, uh, as you look at other logics, especially of the annotated variety or the fuzzy variety, now the satisfaction relationship is based on, hey, the mapping of atoms to reals, it satisfies it if the uh, real number is greater than or equal to what the mapping specifies and things like that. So the next component we have are implications. So most of the time you don't, you know, implications are going to be built up from the other syntactical structures because the truth table of saying F prime or not F, you know, was logically equivalent to an implication that you've probably seen in other places. Rules are kind of a key thing in logic because this is how reasoning, uh, you know, this is like the basic structure for reasoning. When a conclusion is drawn from a knowledge base or a logic program, you would want to see a chain of rules that goes from this initial set of facts all the way to the deductive conclusion. And we'll talk a bit about ways to compute that in a moment. So just some terminology with the rule. Uh, we have three different things we can call the two sides of the rule. So uh, you have the antecedent or the precondition or the body, which is the thing that happens first. And then you have the consequent or the post condition or the head. And then especially in a lot of logic circles, you will see rules written where the arrow goes the other way, all right? But everything is the same, it's just, you know, the direction of implication is just written, it's just notational. So sometimes we'll see also uh, certain frameworks will want to put everything as a rule. And, you know, this, I, when we talk about the fixed point operator in a moment, uh, we'll kind of see why that's a, a sensible thing to do. So if you want to specify a fact, something that's true at the beginning of the reasoning process, you just have a rule with no body. This is the same as saying, if true, then F, which means, you know, F is just going to happen. Oftentimes, in most frameworks, rule heads are typically going to be atoms or negations of atoms. Uh, yeah. Do, can you have like a necessary and sufficient um, like implication? 
Well, so a necessary and sufficient implication, yes, you could do that. Um, in most frameworks that are rule based, you would you know kind of treat that as a macro for two rules where they're going both ways. But yeah, yeah. So if you have F implies F prime and F prime implies F. That. Yeah. Now the issue is where you're gonna where it's going to be framework dependent, and what we'll talk about in a minute is when the logical language is restricted. So if I have a language where the rule bodies are conjunctions of atoms and the heads are all uh, literals, then I can't do that because I, you know, uh, the framework isn't going to allow me to conclude a conjunction from a singleton. So, or I lose whatever, usually when they do that, they're going for theoretical guarantees. I'll lose my theoretical guarantees. All right, so a logic program is kind of the next step up. And this is just a set of logical formulas, okay? And the idea is the logic program is, these are things that you know are going to hold true about you know, my domain of interest. Usually uh, what you see in logic programming is there'll be a subset of the logic program called facts, which are these rules that don't have any bodies. And a lot of times you'll see the logic program, especially in things that are more rule focused, you'll see that there will be, uh, you know, that there will be the facts, which are uh, you know just all the propositions and the uh, you know the rules. Now the use of other formulas beyond rules, depending on the framework, those may be present as well. We will see when we get to some of the MSR work that formulas they're kind of used in many cases to constrain the learning process. Likewise, with a pure logic-based framework, formulas that aren't rules, you can also think of those as uh, constraints as well, like integrity constraints. Um, another reason for separating out facts from the rest of the logic program is if you think of this kind of like, you know, a supervised machine learning model, just to draw an analogy, you could think of just the rules and maybe the constraints, that's like a supervised model, and the facts that's like your specific instance that you're instantiating on. You want to draw a conclusion from that. So we do have a notion of satisfaction between because since the logic program is just a set of formulas, it itself is a, a syntactical structure. So we say a world satisfies an entire program if it satisfies everything. You can also think of a program as a big long conjunction of all those formulas as well. So, okay, so we got all the tools specified and this is now where we start getting into problems. And really the, the two canonical problems within logic are consistency and entailment. And consistency, we talked about this a little bit last class. And we say a logic program is consistent if there exists at least one world that's satisfied. So right here, I've drawn for you, and this was the same thing from the last class, here's a little logic program that is clearly inconsistent because from it, I can conclude both B and not B. There's no world that can satisfy that because B is either in the world or it's not. So nothing can possibly satisfy that. And for those of you who are familiar with intractability, you could probably guess, oh, this looks like this is set. And it is, it's set. So uh, it's an empty hard problem as a result because we're finding a satisfying assignment for those formulas. So all the things that you may know from set solving, you know, hey, there's certain, uh, there are certain set solving problems with certain restrictions that are polynomial. And so all those same things, you know, apply to here. And that kind of thinking from SAT solving, um, you can kind of think the same way about logic. We can restrict things 
to make it easy. But of course, when you restrict things, you also lose capabilities. So we now have the notions of entailments. So entailment we could think of as we have a program and we have a formula. And I want to know if based on everything in that program, all those logical statements, the facts, the rules, the formulas, if I can logically conclude this new formula, this query formula. So entailments is normally defined as if the all the uh, models of the program, all the world that satisfy the program, is a subset of all the world that satisfy the formula. Now think of what that means, okay? Because let's say I have just one world that satisfies the program that doesn't satisfy the formula. If I'm in that world, that formula cannot possibly be true. Now I could have worlds that satisfy that formula that are extra that don't satisfy the program, but that's okay because I care about given that what's in the program is true, is this formula true? Not the other way around. That's what entailment means. So that's why you have the subset notation, for example. So and F yeah. is something that's not in pi, right? What's up? Like F, F or this query formula isn't in the program? It could be, right? It doesn't matter. All that matters is that the, the world's that satisfy. So what you say is a great example, though, right? Let's say F is one of a bunch of stuff in pi, okay? So clearly, there's going to be more worlds that satisfy F, or what there likely is going to be more worlds that satisfy F than satisfy everything in pi simultaneously, right? So that makes sense, because pi should entail everything that's inside it. And you can use that way of thinking to help your intuition on this. So we can all take a logical formula and come up with some convoluted way to write the exact same logical formula again. And you can show it to someone, you say, hey, does this program entail? And it should, because it's buried in there, it's just you obfuscated it by being weird. And so these are ways to help you think about the entailment problem. Now, as you see, this is like a complementary problem to consistency in most Frameworks, this will be a Cohen VR problem. 